introduce our first presentation here this morning. Uh, two of my, my friends from Bozeman that I have the honor to work with there, uh, Pat Hoffman and Dean Adams. Uh, uh, first, Pat um, is from, he teaches high school at um, Bozeman Senior High where he's been for about t the last 12 years and he's a practicing artist, uh, has a studio, maintains a studio, just built a nice new wood kiln and uh, his work has been shown around the, the region, uh, had a beautiful show at the Muse Missoula Art Museum and um, it's been being collected by various uh, corporate collections around the country. Uh, so he's very active. And he continues, he continually feeds us really good students out of his program at uh, Bozeman Senior High, so we're always grateful for that. And uh, Dean Adams on the right is a longtime colleague of mine. Uh, we teach together at Montana State University where he's a associate professor um, and is a foundations coordinator and among many other things. Uh, Dean uh, has, lives in Bozeman and uh, got his master's at University of Iowa, studied at different places around the country, uh, spent time at June Canico's studio. His, his work's being collected in Europe and Turkey currently and other places around the country. And uh, uh, most notably, uh, Dean's a co-founder of the Wild Clay, International Wild Clay Research Project with myself. So we do that uh, looking at indigenous materials around the, the region and uh, different ways of processing clay and, and uh, sustainable systems for that. For, so uh, they, these guys have a really interesting uh, talk for you this morning. They were involved with a great project at uh, Montana State University that took them to Italy and then back to Montana and they've been involved with a great program this last year and without any further ado, I'll let them take the floor. Thanks guys. Thank you, Josh, for that warm welcome. It's great to have uh, colleagues within a community that we get to collaborate with. Um, we're here to talk to you today about Italy, like Josh said, and, our, and Dean and I's collaboration. I want to thank everybody else for showing up this morning. This is a rich conference. I'm excited to contribute. There's a lot of options to go uh, to any number of lectures or shows in the morning, so thank you for attending this morning. You're looking at a picture on the slide of uh, a few ancient objects, some ceramic objects in the foreground of a beautiful, uh, beautiful backdrop. This is Stabia. We spent uh, 10 days doing research in the area of Pompeii. We were south of Naples. We visited a number of different dig sites uh, right around Mount Vesuvius, which erupted in 79 AD. Uh, the most famous of sites being Pompeii. We studied some uh, peripheral sites that were wonderful, uh, most specifically Oplantis, which Dean's going to tell you about. So this is, a, this is an embarrassment of riches for us. Oplantis is a villa uh, just up from Pompeii on the bay. It was 140 years old when it died in the eruption in 79 AD of Vesuvius. And uh, when, the, when the Bourbons were trying to steal a, a collection of art to rival the papacies, they would dig their bourbon holes into these villas. Everybody knew where this, this area was, what houses were there. There was a medieval map uh, by that time. And they called this the Golden Mile, right? You could walk from villa to villa without stepping on, uh, on poor people's land. And when the bourbons drilled into, dug into this villa, they hit the slave quarters. And they tunneled around in there, and right when they got to the main wall, they made their way out. And so in the 1960s, 1963, when uh, the Italians went and unearthed this villa, everything was there. All the art was there. And this is the only one. And when you see a show of Pompeii uh, artifacts, generally you see things that come from Pompeii, and maybe you'll see some uh, objects from Herculaneum. But in this case, we had this exhibit. It um, was at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, part of MSU. Uh, we had it from June 20th through the end of December. 
every object in this exhibit came from this one villa, from this one house. So it all belongs together. And um, none of these objects had been seen before. They had never been shown publicly in Italy or, or even outside of Italy as well. And the exhibit went to three places. So it started at the Kelsey in Ann Arbor, Michigan, came to Bozeman to the Museum of the Rockies, and then it's, I think right now it's at Smith College. And then they go back to Italy, and under Italian law, these objects can never leave again. And so we had this great opportunity uh, to, to have this exhibit happening during our entire fall semester, and, uh, and an opportunity to work with our community and uh, the, the, the K-12 people, the whole university across the university, and design curriculum that we were able to share and design together around this exhibit. So Dean spoke to uh, this site, this villa, Oplantis. Uh, the slide that you're looking at right now, we're, we're a group of, I believe, 10 to 12. Uh, we, we're a group of 12 people total. So there's many different disciplines from MSU, including myself and uh, another, another discipline, Project Archaeology, which I'm going to explain here in a little bit. But, the slides that we're looking at, we had this, op this wonderful opportunity to interact with the villa very intimately. We, um, we were receiving a lecture right now by Dr. Michael Thomas, who um, was one of the main archaeologists on this site. In, within that group, there is uh, Professor uh, Regina G. from MSU, who is a fresco scholar. And she, Elplantis is where most of her academic uh, scholarly writings come from. So to be able to be in the presence of people that have studied this site for such a long period of time uh, was a very special opportunity. Uh, a, few of the, a few of the other pictures, uh, the largest one on the bottom, is a, a very small, intimate fresco. I fell in love with these small paintings, these landscape paintings that just kind of riddled the, the hallways. Uh, they're quite wonderful. I'm not sure if Dean has anything to add here, but as we continue on, um, we are most specifically looking at ceramic objects. Um, Pompeii, the image on the left, there's, there's these large jars that hold, that we assume held grains and different kinds of food. Um, and on the right, the far right, we see a stack of amphora that is a, a more contemporary way of storing these objects. The most interesting slide for me was the slide in the middle. What you're looking at is a lead patch that was fixed uh, an amphora, or a very large jar, I'm sorry, in the field at Stabia. The thing that made this the most interesting to us, I, I believe, is, is the value of this object during its time. It, it was seen as so useful or so important in the moment that they needed to fix it with a lead patch. Whereas now we're interacting with these objects, on, like the slide on the right, where they're stacked on these metal shelves. They seem uh, the repetition of these objects seem very, um, what would be a good description of that would be just, they, they're kind of discarded or put away. We look at them as um, these objects not in use, whereas this, this image in the middle uh, showed me in particular how important the object was during that time. So the dramatics of the landscape, that's Mount Vesuvius in the background. Again, this dig site is Stabia and uh, more storage jars. So as you walk through Pompeii, you're able to see a lot of, uh, a lot of how the markets and the interaction of the space uh, when, when, when Pompeii was a rich village. So we have this common ground. So we, we have ceramics that were part of the reason that we're there. We have pigments as well. And this villa was uh, probably the wealthiest villa on the bay when it died. Uh, we think it belonged to the madman Nero's mistress turned second wife's family. I know that's a long adjective. Uh, uh, whom he kicked to death in a fit of rage, um, as an aside. But this is, you know, this whole area on the bay gets developed around the same time that uh, Yellowstone Park is being developed, right? So we're talking about a, a, a consumption of the romantic landscape, as shown here in these, in these hand-colored photographs. And so this gave us an opportunity to to really reach out to our colleagues across campus. And we went, Regina, Dr. G and I went around campus and, 
and tried to convince faculty to be involved in this and to design curriculum around it. We didn't have to convince anyone. They, faculty were two steps ahead of us. And our students uh, uh, from across campus also had their hands on helping design the exhibit, which was great. And the, the, the collaboration involved so many different disciplines. We had earth sciences, we're talking about living in the shadow of hazards. Bozeman is in the shadow of Yellowstone National Park, which is the only super volcano on the planet that is above water. Uh, and, and even though we're not threatened by eruption uh, the way many of, of the Italian communities are, uh, on a regular basis, we still have that. Uh, we had uh, the high school and the middle school. We designed some curriculum for the K-5 as well. We had the, the School of Architecture talking about the consumption of luxury. We had philosophy uh, talking about ethics and uh, combining with biology to talk about who had access to science and technology and how that was developed in the ancient world and, and the parallels that we have with that today. And so you'll see this large group of faculty that uh, were all part of that literature as well. Um, and we just had this amazing uh, cross dialogue between all the di disciplines as we designed this curriculum. It was a fun team to work with. This is, a, this is where it gets kind of interesting for me as a high school teacher. Uh, the relationships within our community, um, it's, it's something that really drives education in Bozeman. Um, the picture we're looking at right now is uh, Dr. or I'm sorry, Professor Watson from the School of Architecture, Bradford Watson. He's, uh, he's fantastic, really dynamic, and very willing to collaborate. So we came up with this idea to host an exhibit at Bozeman High School. It's called the Robert and Jenny DeWeese Gallery in the high school. We're lucky enough to have a beautiful gallery space within our community. But part of the goal was to bring MSU into the high school and have a really rich, engaged conversation. Bradford took a team of architecture students back to Italy to design and, and come up with ideas of ways to host these objects after they leave the exhibit at the Museum of the Rockies. So the, the concept basically is a very small community in Italy, Toria Nunziata, owns these objects, but they really have never seen them or been able to celebrate them. Bradford was able to bring students to Italy to conceptualize ways in which they can house these objects permanently. That in and of itself is a wonderful concept. It became a larger exhibit. Their drawing boards, their concepts, and other collaborations became an exhibition in and of itself. So if you think about this exhibition at the Museum of Objects, uh, we, had a, we had a secondary exhibit within our community of design concepts. So Bradford came to Bozeman High School with this exhibition, um, came into my classroom and spoke. We had wonderful uh, studio workshop experiences and lectures based around uh, a larger theme within our community, which is uh, unprecedented for me as an educator to experience this type of curriculum development. So this next slide, we're looking at uh, a, a very large CNC model of the Bay of Naples, most specifically the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. And uh, there was a, a lot of collaboration happening at MSU between Earth Sciences, School of Architecture, and even uh, film and photography. So architecture students designed this, this model with the help of Earth Sciences and having very specifics uh, about what happened during that eruption. Um, and then it, a film became edited and projected down onto this model. So a lot went into designing exhibition design. This model was hosted at MSU, I'm sorry, at, at the Museum of the Rockies, but also at Bozeman High School. And students were able to experience uh, what it meant to do exhibition design, what it requires to put together an exhibit. And beyond that, we were able to, Dean and I were able to collaborate and make very large uh, molds and slip casted models of two halves of Mount Vesuvius. So this is more curriculum that uh, we worked on that traveled throughout the state. What, you're, what we're looking at right now are the halves of Mount Vesuvius and the, and the process of creating these molds. But Dean and I chose to not do this within our private studios. We did this at Bozeman High School 
during the class day um, in my ceramics, advanced ceramics class. So my students were able to witness problem solving uh, in a pretty major way. This was a difficult uh, mold to create. It was very heavy. And we needed to produce 32 halves of Mount Vesuvius that were packaged into a larger curriculum packet and traveled throughout the state. Which leads me to what this is all about for me. I was able to secure funding separately from MSU through Humanities Montana to travel to Italy because Dean invited me along um, and I was honored to do so. But the larger goal wasn't just to simply go do research, it was to try to figure out how I could create a class at Bozeman High School that mimicked seminar classes at a college level. And uh, we're going to get into the specifics of, of what that looked like, but my high school seminar class was a, was a project-based class um, that required research and a tremendous amount of time at the Museum of the Rockies itself. I like to think about the museum as an extended classroom and spend a little bit of time talking about uh, not the museum as a singular experience, which is oftentimes how we experience museums, uh, especially within a K-12 uh, format. It becomes a field trip. It's a singular experience where you consume large amounts of information in a very small window of time. I wanted to use the museum as a place where we consistently uh, traveled and spent our class periods um, immersed in the exhibit itself. We, I, uh, we, we were able to make it to the museum nine times in the semester and uh, through the process of seven guest lectures at the museum and very, uh, very project-driven, object-driven research, the museum, we were able to transcend the museum as, as a field trip experience and it became very normal to come back, sketch, draw, and experience this exhibit uh, in a different way. One of the first things we did with, with students was design a scavenger hunt, just as an assignment on how we wanted them to start to notice the exhibit. And so we'd ask them to look for the oldest thing in the exhibit, the youngest thing in the exhibit, in terms of the objects. Uh, we'd ask them to find connections between different, different objects in the exhibit and to classify all of the objects in different ways. Come up with as many ways as possible that they could classify the different objects. Use, uh, whether they were uh, uh, iconographic, whether they were narrative, um, and, then, and then maybe even what the material was made out of. And this became a way for us actually to start looking at designing other experiences for our students when we, when we go to Italy with our students in the spring or when we go to New York and go to other museums, that this scavenger hunt can be a way that we have the students look very intentionally uh, at a collection or an exhibition uh, rather than just walk through it and, and, and try to notice what they notice. We give them specific things that we ask them to try to find. Sometimes we give them a list of objects, but oftentimes we just try to get them to classify it so that we, when we discuss it later, we can see the different ways that people notice things uh, in an exhibition because we don't all see things the same way. And so the scavenger hunt has been a, a, a great way that we're able to do that. Uh, we also had uh, assignments where we, uh, and this is just the overview, we'll get into the details here in a minute, but we wanted students to consider what it meant to, what it took to make an object. We wanted them to find the human uh, in this because these are all unnamed makers, right? These are unknown people, these things aren't signed. So we wanted people, our students, to be able to go through the exhibit and find some sort of mark, whether it was a, a fingerprint or a brush mark, some indication that says a human was here or that a human made this. Uh, we worked with mosaics and frescoes. We worked with the amphora, of course. Um, we did a, a, a curation and recuration uh, assignment. We did an oil lamp to light the dark, talked about what it took to, to light the dark in that time period, um, and the ways that creatives research which was a class that we taught that involved studio majors, art history majors, undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and then we talked about restoration and the pleasure of the original. So we'll get into the details here. I had a semester long object based research study that I asked the students to uh, find one object in particular in the exhibit that interested them. That then took them on a journey. Uh, this was an idea that isn't new in any way, 
I suppose, to research, but it's new for a high school student to think about objects in a different context. I wanted students to look at something from the past that took them into their own personal interests as they travel into their futures of research at colleges and uh, universities and different experiences that they have in their future of research. I wanted them to see how powerful it is to let an object take you on a journey um, as, you, as you delved into something that interested you personally. The specific fresco fragment, it's a fourth style landscape. Uh, I had one student who chose this object and it was less about uh, frescoes and it was more, she was more interested in what was being depicted in this fresco. She became consumed with that idea of the depiction of landscape. She then found herself studying the ways in which Romans framed landscape and they did the way they did that architecturally and the way that they depicted landscape and frescoes. She then took her journey into photography and studied ways in which we frame landscape now. And she compared and contrasted the uh, manners in which uh, not only landscape was framed, but the way we approached and thought about landscape. Um, I was very proud of her research. It was, it was uh, Bradford Watson coming from the School of Architecture and speaking to her about the ways that architecture frames landscape allowed her to travel even further into her research. And I guess this one particular example showed me that students oftentimes aren't asked to think about research in this way. It's very structured in a high school level. And this freedom within this entire semester took her to a place that she did not anticipate being uh, prior to that. It was quite wonderful. Like so many exhibits, including exhibits that are around here at Enseca right now, uh, these objects are meant to be in motion oftentimes, but in a museum or in a gallery show, they're on a pedestal, oftentimes they're under some sort of glass or plexiglass, um, and we have this issue of the politics of display. We are constantly uh, dealing with this with our students at the university especially. So if we have a graduate student who's working on their thesis exhibit, uh, we're saying, you know, how are you going to display this work, and how do you want to display it, what do you want the work to convey. And so this exhibit gave us a, an opportunity to talk about this with our students and have them think about uh, what would happen if you put these objects in motion. How does your experience change, uh, your experience of these objects, if you were to envision them moving through the space or somebody using them or somebody wearing them if it was jewelry. And, and this is, a, I think, a real integral uh, issue for us uh, teaching at the universities and high schools right now just in terms of how we display pots, especially. And then uh, we talked about curation and re-curation. Re so what it took for the curator to pick the objects that came to the exhibit, because not everything from the villa could come. And so how were those choices made and why were those choices made? And then the way we get the students to really start to think about this is we ask them to pick 10 objects and re-curate those 10 objects. And they're gonna, they can assign one text with those 10 objects as well. I mean, they're required to assign one text. And this gives them a way to connect a reading, up to the objects and pick their own 10 objects and why they would choose those 10 objects for an exhibit. It gives them a way to start to think about their own work as well, relationships between the different objects in a, in a show. The Seed Jar is a Radio Lab podcast about an object that is discovered in the back country in uh, the southern United States. If you haven't heard it before, I highly recommend that you listen to this uh, half hour podcast. I used this particular podcast in my classroom, we listened to it and generated a discussion about object permanence and the importance of an object when taken out of, uh, out of its context, I suppose. Um, we talked about ethics and preservation, uh, which led us to the ethics of studying human remains. Uh, this initiated a very rich discussion in the classroom um, about the ways that we treat objects and the ways that we find objects to be special, especially when we put them on a pedestal in a museum. It's a, the objects that we're looking at are everyday use objects most of the time. Uh, they, were, they were used constantly in their time period, but when we take them out of that context, I think that we view them in a different way, and it helped students frame that for their research. 
We also looked at curation as a way of understanding their own work. So I already talked about the first point that's a way to understand the objects that we're looking at or to, to change the context of those objects in some cases. But we also asked our students to pick 10 objects from their home and bring those in and, and curate an exhibition with those. And how would, they, how would they choose that? Or how would people in the future look at the objects that they had in their house? And it's a way to start to understand their own work and their own lives and their own identities. Uh, we also had this assignment about to consider what it took to make the object. And this becomes like a method card, right? So this is uh, something in ideation and, and creative thinking to list all of the steps that are required to make an object in an exhibit. And that allows the students to start to consider, uh, was it made in, uh, in a large workshop? Was it made at a studio elsewhere and then sold uh, to be in the home? Or was it made in the home itself? Was it a site-specific uh, fresco, for example? And how many workers did it take? What did it take to get those materials? Um, uh, what was the meaning of the work? And what was the context of the work? And how did it, if this villa was 140 years old, how, what was the context of the work 140 years later? Why was the oldest object a Hellenistic terracotta piece? Was this a, a god that they worshipped? Or was it an, an antique that they valued? Um, and so to come up with this list of the hurdles and the barriers uh, and, the, and the materials that it took to make work becomes an interesting way for the students to start to also think about their own work. And that kind of covered our, our conceptual side of spending time at the museum and thinking about objects, but it was important at the high school that I engage the students in project-based studio time. Um, we're looking at two slides of uh, high school students um, making their own amphora. I want to remind everybody that these, this group of students are, are in a seminar class. They're not necessarily in my ceramics class. They have never spent any time engaged with making. Uh, that's a big assumption. Some of the students were strong art students. However, a lot of them had no experience in the, in the clay studio. So we worked with coil and press mold to create our own amphora. We sprayed them machino and uh, reduction fired them to cone 10. They turned out wonderful. The better experience, I think, rather than the making part, was the rich discussion in the studio of engaging students with material as they had just finished studying these objects at the museum. Uh, it was not a forced discussion in the classroom. I found students talking about amphora and talking about their shapes and the function of their shapes, the, the cattywampus handles and the warped rims, um, how heavy their amphora were. And that led us to function and form. Students were thinking about pots, uh, maybe for the first time, and really what it meant to engage function and form. Part of the function and form, you know, if you, I bet most of you were educated in a similar way that I was, that the, the form of the amphora with the, the long spike that they call the toe at the, at the foot of the vessel was about shipping these. This is how they fit in the holds of the ship so that they could transport their wine to other regions. So on land, they would actually take a whole cow, they would essentially tan this cow hide, sew it up into a giant boda bag, and fill that with wine, and they'd put that in a cart, and they'd bring it to the coast, and then the coast, they'd put it in large storage jars, and then eventually they would put it in the amphorae, which is how they were wine bottles, and then they would distribute them. And so I've always learned that this was about, that the, the design, the form of the amphora was about uh, the shipping, and in this case, the storage. You can see in that image uh, on the lower uh, right there, the amphora were found upside down with the toe going into the mouth of the next one, and they were able to stack them relatively high that way. But one day we were talking about how, uh, how we research, and there was, a, there was a, a piece of jewelry in the exhibit that was identified as a body chain, but it was displayed as a necklace. And so our students said, why is this a necklace? I don't understand what the body chain means. And so Dr. G said, well, the first thing that she does is to start to go to the frescoes, to the wall paintings, because that's her expertise. And so she'll look for some sort of scene that shows somebody wearing jewelry. And that was how she found the body chain. In the middle of that presentation, she showed these images just by chance. And it hit me that the design of the amphora, the innovation that the potter, that the maker came up with, was not for shipping. It was for how to pour wine from the amphora. That toe, that long spike, acts as a lever, as a handle, so that a slave 
who is filling a crater with wine for a dinner party is able to lift a 30-pound object with another 30 pounds of liquid in it and pour it into the crater without spilling it because that toe acts as that. They can rest the, the, the mouth in their arms and they can use that toe as a lever to control how the liquid comes out. And I can't find any writing about that. And, but I think as a maker, I think, well, of course. And I see it in the frescoes and the mosaics. Like that's how the object is being used. And I think that that was really the potter's innovation. And I was able to share that with our students, that that was sort of a new, a new way for me to consider the object and maybe contribute to the research. So in that storytelling that we're able to do research through the depiction of imagery on, through mosaics and frescoes, there's a tremendous amount of information uh, being communicated through a fresco and through a, a mosaic. That is the visual storytelling that we're able to uh, glean anything we need to know about ancient Romans. Uh, in addition to the writings, of course, but it really helps to have visual information. My students, as well as Dean's, uh, worked on mosaics. Dean worked on frescoes. The mosaics, by far, were the most popular project within this class. It took more time than I had, than I had anticipated. Uh, students worked with porcelain tiles. They broke them into fragments, uh, put them back together in geometric patterns, and some of them even spent time telling stories. Uh, they were able to un use underglaze and fire them low fire, and some students wanted to use the reduction kiln and fire them high fire for some of those colors. So at this point in the semester, they were beginning to engage the studio classroom uh, as a place of exploration and research in and of itself. They were approaching the material and need, they had to learn about firing processes in order to arrive at the colors uh, in addition to looking at mosaics, in addition to studying frescoes, they were making objects. So we had, uh, we had a geologist with us on this research trip. His name's David Moak. He spent a lot of time taking pictures of the patterns uh, within these mosaics. So not specifically like at the uh, Museum of Archaeology in Naples where you're able to see mosaics and large storytelling. Uh, he was more interested in the, the, the doorways. When you enter a room there was different mosaics, different patterns that were depicted kind of explaining maybe what that, the, the change of room and the change of space. So we spent some time looking at these different patterns. Um, reflection, rotation, Symmetry, translation, glide, these were new words for me. They shouldn't be, but they kind of were. I had never approached uh, mosaics in this way, and it was really awesome to collaborate with Dave uh, from Earth Sciences and have him point things out that, you know, I, I really hadn't spent time considering before. And Dave Moak is a, is a clay mineralogist. So he was able to talk to us about this is how clay crystallography happens as well. This is the same way that crystals in clay form. And so we were able to use this as a, a foundational way to talk about symmetry with our, found, you know, with our foundation students and then uh, as a way to also talk to the earth science students about how clay crystals form. I got a little bit ahead of myself talking about the firing processes the students engaged in, but th these are a few examples of their finished mosaics. And because of the nature of this class and the seminar and the research, um, I was, they were able to have a lot of freedom. I let them take their projects wherever they wanted to go. I think they turned out quite beautifully. So some classic high school photos here. There's my group of students on the left with everyone's mosaic. In the middle, I have a student sketching. This was part of uh, that, that collaboration with Bradford Watson I spoke of earlier from the Robert and Jenny DeWeese Gallery. He's, we spent time putting students in open spaces and sketching and drawing. So students were, were working in a clay classroom. They were working with their drawing techniques. And then the far slide on the right, they were able to experience what it meant to silkscreen, uh, three color separation, and work in the design studio designing posters for an exhibit. So they had a hand in many different aspects of this curriculum. We did coins too, and we didn't have the, the setup to really do these out of metal, so we did them out of clay. And it was a way to talk about the concept of the coin. What is a coin? It's propaganda. Uh, we can do portraiture on the coin. A coin is a two-sided piece, so it's a piece that, uh, that you know, is dealing not just, it's a, it looks 2D, but it's essentially a, a 3D piece. We have two sides that we can use. It's a, it's a piece that we hold in our hands, that we have some sort of haptic experience with. It's a piece that we carry in our pockets. And so we talked about this idea of a coin as, a, as an art object, 
uh, that has value and we're able to trade it for things with other value. I'd like to add, uh, you don't need to go back to the slide before, we were running out of time and I really wanted to include the coin. Dean and I had collaborated on the concept of making a coin. Uh, so students had to make a self-portrait with their coin and it became a, another silk screening project. So it was not a clay engaged project for my classroom, but they were still able to consider the coin and the obverse and the reverse and what it meant to tell, tell as much of a story as you could on a coin. The oil lamps, which are uh, ubiquitous in the ancient Roman world, we find them, you know, they're mostly press molded, sometimes they're hand built, depending on what period and what part of that world, the, what part of the world they're built in. But this gave us a way for our students to work with the idea of a personalized flashlight, a decorative flashlight, some way to light the dark. Why would we even want to light the dark? What do we burn in it? Uh, how does the form follow the function? Uh, what decorative elements can we put in there? And uh, can it be a handheld? Can it light a room? In some cases, they go on stands, and we had lots of objects to look at. But this wasn't about recreating necessarily the historical object, but to think about their own, the students to think about their own uh, visual language and how they wanted to use that. One of my favorite part of this, parts of this curriculum was a, a class that Dr. G and I taught together, which was the ways that creatives research. And we, bless you, we did this in the museum. We met two days a week in the museum, and it was after it was closed. Our students were the most privileged audience ever for this exhibition. Uh, we were in there two evenings every week, and then on Fridays we were in the studio. So we had the text, we had the, the catalog that, the, that came with the exhibit, so we read that. We had the, the Pliny, uh, all of the ancient writing, so we could read that, so we had this textual research. Then we had the collections research. So we spent all this time in the exhibit, uh, sketching things, looking at things, writing about the different objects, and that was, could be compared also to field research. And then we had the haptic research. So now we're gonna go make things, and what can we learn about ourselves, about this exhibit by making things. And we were also interested in this idea of the pleasure of the original. Uh, what happens when we restore an object, as in the terracotta army in China? Uh, what happens when where maybe we're looking at a forgery, things were fixed. Uh, we often see this in the frescoes where the, the fourth style artists were actually fixing the second style frescoes, but they didn't know how to do it, so they'd do it wrong. Well, how do we interpret that work? And then the fact that none of these people were, um, you know, were, were named, we talked about the unknown craftsmen and compare that to Grayson Perry's uh, exhibition at the British Museum, the Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, as well as the movement of the Unknown Craftsman in Japan, and then uh, uh, this idea of a culture of knockoffs. So we had students write about those different, those different aspects of, of the original. Um, and we had a digital model that was uh, designed for us and built for us by uh, King Universe, King's University in, in London, and it was a model that we could, it's a, called a first shooter platform from gaming. Uh, you can walk through and you can click and the frescoes will restore as they were in, in the time that they were made or you can click again and it'll go as it is today. And you can navigate through the entire, uh, the entire villa in this digital platform. So we talk about what does that experience mean? What, what do we take from that experience? Is it better? Is it different? How does it enhance our understanding of the actual villa? Does it matter if you've never been to the villa? Or what happens when we see uh, you know, a, a reproduction, essentially almost a, a Photoshop or Illustrator situation where we build something that's been lost, it's only been written about. What kind of experience is that of an object? It was difficult to talk to my seminar class about a space that they won't have the opportunity to visit, at least during that seminar, uh, that they would have to travel to Italy on their own. And so this idea of this digital model of this space, this uh, first person perspective, walking through the space and navigating much like a video game became very popular within my classroom. Students were also able to attend an international symposium with many of these scholars involved in the Villa Oplantis uh, coming to Bozeman and speaking. Uh, MSU and the Museum of the Rockies brought all of these speakers in. It's unusual for a high school seminar class to be able to attend an all day symposium one of the more popular discussions within my classroom was this digital model, the manner in which it was created, and our idea of space and the way that we interact with space. Something that we took from our new dean, Roy Smith, who came from Wichita State, and, uh, and we stole from Ted Adler as well, was this idea of classes or, or assignments that were called a slow burn or a fast fire. And I think this is a great paradigm 
for education today because we've always been trying to cram things into semesters or quarters or fit them in or shoehorn them in or whatever it takes to have those educational experiences and we haven't been very flexible. This idea of a shared K-20 curriculum where assignments were developed together and had to be flexible enough that they could be taught at the elementary level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, at the undergraduate and graduate levels at the university, that these assignments could be used as a, as a scaffold or a framework and then we could tailor them appropriately to the group of students that we were teaching also required the flexibility of having an assignment that lasted maybe a week uh, and then a different assignment that lasted the whole semester. Like how we carry one object through this idea of a whole semester or maybe we do something very quickly like the coins where we're just talking about a week. And this is a model that we can apply to our curriculum elsewhere where we can have, um, and I'll use Wichita State's assignment as an example. They had a custodian from Korea who was really into kimchi and she made her own kimchi. So they brought her in to teach the ceramic students about kimchi, how kimchi's made, taste it, and then the students designed uh, jars, kimchi jars, uh, around this idea with, that they were discussing with the custodian about how she made kimchi versus a class that doesn't fit into a semester. So maybe it's a kiln design class uh, that a semester isn't enough time because we need to learn from the kiln and redesign and rebuild the kiln. Stretch that class out so it happens over a course of a whole year and change the model in which we teach and make it appropriate for what we want to deliver. We don't need every class or every assignment to be a whole semester long. And our earth science faculty are able to teach their passion, uh, politics and geology, uh, living in the shadow of hazards. They're doing the same thing. They're teaching their 100 level earth science classes, which are core general education required classes. Sometimes they're teaching them in one week, field trip to Yellowstone Park, come back, write about it, discuss a reading. I think it's a, a great model. I think we should all be looking at it. And before Dean talks about design and function for a moment, there's a holistic way of thinking about approaching objects and making that was a new way of thinking for my seminar class. Dean was able to come and talk to my class. The plan was to talk about amphora. I think it, it extended to materials. It extended to thinking about commerce and trade and thinking about a bigger picture that maybe uh, students would have never have con considered before. They would have just considered the object, whereas Dean came in and gave them a larger picture and a, a bigger window to look through about changing that context. I just wanted to share this near the end. Uh, so these black and white stripes, what we call the zebra stripes, these are uh, fresco areas within the villa that were meant to be areas that you move through. One moved through these areas. They were uh, between the slave quarters and the dining and entertaining area. And these were not areas where one settled or hung out. And we think that they use this design element of black and white stripes as a way to keep people moving through that area. On my way back from Italy, I got stuck in O'Hare, and I was walking, I slept in four of the five terminals, and as I was walking between terminals, they were using the black and white stripes. We still use these as a graphic indicator of moving through the area. That is a, just a quick snapshot with my phone of a corridor between terminals two and three with the black and white stripes on the floor as a way to keep moving. Even though we aren't talking about just uh, Oplantis, we're using that as a way you know, to deliver this lecture, uh, I wanted you to let you know that there is an Oplantis Project website and Facebook page. It's all open source. This was part of John Clark from UT Austin's uh, uh, mission with this project, is that everything would be open and accessible to anyone. There are very high quality photos. Uh, everything that they've been found, that's been found in the villa, they're documenting it, it's getting up on the web and you can, uh, you can access it free of charge. And uh, so this is just a, a shot from the, the web site. And that's Dr. G, uh, MSU art historian, uh, looking at the, at the frescoes. We owe so much to her. It was because of her that MSU was able to get this exhibit and have it at the Museum of the Rockies. So thank you for your time. If there are any questions or comments, we tried to leave enough time to, to have that. Come on up to the mic, please. Step on up to the mic, yeah. You were talking about the unknown craftsman um, and that idea um, about identity in the past. And how do you think that, that applies to the present now with social media and how artists are documenting their everyday, you know, construction methods and processes? And uh, how do you think the two correlate? And um, is social media a benefit to the arts? 
or is it kind of like a two-edged sword? Well, there's this idea that we are, uh, you, you know, everything is a remix and there's nothing original, right? If there's any, any way that you've considered your life or the universe or your first experience with injustice or hate or love, the ancient Greeks considered it probably more deeply than you have. And they probably wrote a play about it even, right? Or some sort of epic poem. So there are lots of things that are original for us as individuals because we're all born midstream. And, and we can't know everything that happened before us. But it's part of our, our goal in education is to learn uh, what came before us and whose shoulders we're standing on. And so I think social media helps us with that for sure. But there's another thing that happens. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are writers. They're very careful not to read other people's writing when they're working on final drafts of their books or on first drafts of their books because they're worried about being polluted by that. But as visual artists, I love looking at art. But I also know sometimes uh, somebody's work sneaks into my, my mind and I start trying to make their work and I'm not aware of it. This happened to me with Morgan Ringer one time. I saw him at the Bray and, and I was on my way to Watershed and I went to Watershed and I was going to make new work that I'd never made before because why go to a residency and just make what I'd made at home? And the work failed miserably and I got back to Montana and I went up to the Bray and walked into Morgan's studio and I realized immediately what had happened and I said, oh Morgan, I owe you an apology. I tried making your work. <laughs> Uh, or in the summer, and he said, get out of my studio. So, you know, that can happen too. But I think this idea of, you know, we, we ask our students and we ask of ourselves that we make original research or original objects. It's a, that's a tricky word to use. I'm not sure that what's original and what that means. And I could, I could speak to that a bit from the perspective of a high school teacher. Uh, it, it's a safe place for students often to mimic or make what they see because this is a first time experience for them within a ceramic studio to make anything at all. I see, I see my handle, my feet, uh, the shapes that I throw and demo end up becoming uh, other students' work, but also they spend a lot of time on Instagram once they fall in love with ceramics, mimicking the work of others. And I think when you're getting started, that's okay. Uh, the, the Romans did it to the Greeks, like Dean said. They did it with all of their wonderful work. And there's workshops throughout the, throughout the Bay of Naples that, where they, they were asked to mimic work and make the same thing and recreate. So it's been happening for ages and ages, and I, I love that that comes up at the high school, and we talk about that. And I say, that's, your craftsmanship's improving. How can you make it yours? And that's a fun conversation to have. I just want them to... to emulate really good work <laughs> and my wife has a real gift of uh, she can look at a foot or a handle and she can tell immediately who that maker studied with or who their teacher studied with she's really gifted at it um, so you know I mean it is important that we it is important that we look at other work and imitate it that way for sure yes Oh, I'm happy to answer that. Repeat it. So this gentleman's asking about the logistics of um, getting my class from point A to point B in addition to you're seeing my student numbers and, and just how I pulled this thing off. And I, I appreciate that question. It's a good one. It was tough. We went to Italy in 2015. I didn't teach the class till the fall of 2016. Uh, that's correct, in dates, right? So I had a lot of time to plan, and I spent a lot of time in the administration's office explaining to them exactly what I wanted to do. It required some arm twisting and some uh, pleading. There was also a lot of collaboration within my community. The Museum of the Rockies offered to pay for half of the bus trips to and from the museum. Uh, I asked for scheduling to be right up against lunch. And every Friday that we went to the museum, I did take their lunch period, and I informed the class at the beginning of the semester that every Friday, I do apologize. I'll, I'm taking your lunch, your time away from you. However, I'm going to make sure that it's valuable time. And they bought, they really, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they bought into it. They loved it. Uh, they ate their lunch on the bus, and we were able to have two hours at the museum instead of one. I teach in 50-minute classes. Dean often jokes that he talks in 50-minute increments, and I can agree with that <laughs> statement. 
I had a class of 24 students for the seminar. My ceramic studio classroom typically is exactly 20 students. I have 10 wheels and 10 spaces for hand builders, and everyone switches spots in beginning ceramics. Um, we're able to limit it to 20 in our school district, and I realized that oftentimes my art foundations classes are 30 students, just like yours, but our advanced classes were able to, to whittle that number down to 20. And I'll say, too, that the, the museum really was great about this. It, they set records. There were record numbers of attendance, not just because of our students, but the show was so special, and people from all over the region came. Um, but this, this was a, a way to really bring our community together around one event and write curriculum about it. One of the issues, I think, when sharing curriculum between a high school and a, and a, and a, a college or university is that if we're going to recruit those students from the high school to the university, and they've already gone through some of these assignments, they might be mad, right, when they get there, like, I already did this in high school. And we say, well, you know, do it better, do it at your new level or whatever. But because this was a one-time event, we were able to share curriculum in a really authentic way that allowed our students to, to mingle with one another and to give feedback to each other and participate in critiques and experiences at the museum together. And I think you could do this with a, with a theme. It doesn't have to be an exhibit in your community. It could be just a theme that you set up or an annual event or some sort of anniversary. And I think it's important. I think as somebody at the university, uh, there's a tendency to talk down to uh, the K-12 people and say you're not doing a good enough job in writing, for example. Our students can't write and we blame you. Uh, this is an opportunity to be equal partners in developing curriculum. I mean, I got a lot of great input from Pat's curriculum that I was able to apply within our, especially our foundations curriculum as well. Any other questions? Yeah. This it's okay. Was, I, I teach TK, uh, transitional t kindergarten. We do murals and things like that. And this was so inspiring because, of course, my kids, I'm trying to keep them in school and want them to keep coming back. And this, the money thing, that is so fantastic. So, um, <laughs> and the materials versus the content with the mural, you know, the mosaic pieces. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank great. you for that. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for that. So I also love the idea of, of what you're doing. So I teach at a small community college. Um, don't have the advantage of a semester or a whole year class, just one quarter. So can you give us some ideas of what we could do in a small town as far as um, what you did big time when we don't have a lot of money? That, that's what I'm trying to think what I can do now in my community college and my high school as far as what you did. But, if you have any ideas, that would be super. I think if you had a, a, a theme that your community cares about or, or identifies itself somehow with, uh, you know, you could, you could anchor some assignments or some work around that theme. Uh, where are you? Can I ask that? Walla Walla. In Walla Walla. Yeah, so, I mean, you have all kinds of things uh, in Walla Walla. You, you're making wine there, right? You're growing grapes. Uh, I mean, you could, you could tie an agricultural piece into it. Uh, that comes with a branding, some sort of graphic design thing as well. Uh, I mean, it could be it could be tied to that. You could um, take something special about. You have a river goes through there, so you could connect something to the river, and that could be a remediation of the river bank. It could be raising some kind of awareness where you involve maybe some nonprofits in the region. Uh, it could be tied to. Uh, I mean, whenever we tie into nonprofits, I think that helps us out quite a bit because um, it's good sort of social work that way. Um, I'd like to add that just stepping out of your space and into someone else's that shares a common interest with you within your community college goes a long way. That collaboration across different disciplines at MSU inspired me as an educator to be involved, however difficult it was going to be, to continue my involvement and figure out ways that I could be part of it. And so it, it took this relationship with Dean in order to pull it off. There's got to be someone at the community college that you share it, you have that same kind of passion. And that's the that's the spark, that's the spot. That was for me. You could also pull out of your region. You have LH Project, uh, the residency down in Joseph and Enterprise in Oregon. Walla Walla is relatively close to that. And you have uh, uh, staff and artists that live and work there uh, that could come up and do a, a project with you around material, perhaps, uh, you know, around ceramics. 
I mean, I bought a couple semi loads of brick out of Walla Walla out of uh, Emory Stubblefield salvage yard, I think, that came out of the nuclear reactor. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, you have things <laughs> and the foundries in the community as well uh, that you could connect to in a similar way. Yeah. I believe we're out of time. Thank you for coming today. Thanks. It's wonderful.